Tommy Boyce from the Casanovas. Welcome to Australian Musician. Great. Pleased to be here. Thanks so much, Greg. Uh, Casanovas are a Melbourne band um, doing lockdown harder than anyone else in Australia. Uh, how are you coping and what have you been doing to fill in the time? Uh, well, we're, before we locked out, had this recent lockdown, I was doing a lot of surfing and, um, you know, driving down the coast and stuff. But now that's been outlawed as well. So yeah. um, I've just been, I've been writing songs, like demoing for the next record. So it's, it's been good. Um, yeah, playing guitar, skateboarding, you know, just stuffing around. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the future, you know. Uh, you've also been presenting some guitar lessons on Facebook. Yeah. Who did you learn from? Were there demos that you watched when you were younger? Did you go to in-store demos, anything like that? Not really, no. I just, because um, I was um, having lessons playing saxophone as a kid. So I already kind of was, had a good musical grounding. And, um, and then I just, my brother played guitar. So I just used to pick up his guitar when he was out and muck around with it. And I found a chord book. Right. And um, I worked out the chords. I was like, oh, wow, you can play like nearly all of ACDC songs with five, learning five chords or something, yeah. you know. So that was a bit of a revelation for me. And then from there on in, I was just like, well, I just worked out stuff by ear, you know, I'd play guitar solos and stop and rewind, stop and rewind, stop and rewind, and, and, and learn like that. Yeah. Reptilian Overlord is the Casanova's album out on August 28th. Why does the world need a Casanova's guitar rock album in 2020? Oh, man. That's a hard question. Why does it need it? Um, I don't know. Well, I still feel like we've got a lot to give, you know, so um, we're going to keep keep making music as long as we've got an audience and, and probably even if we don't have an audience. So, <laughs> But, um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. We're just um, super keen to still make music. Yeah. There's some ripping guitar solos on the album. Um, mm -hmm. Just guitar solos have sort of become a thing of a, the past in, in some way on the radio in this era of laptop pop. Um, what are some of your favourite guitar solos? Ooh, that's a tough question. Um, I, I really love... Um, like, I'm a big fan of Ted Nugent's guitar playing. I just love the freedom, you know, it's sort of like, um, I, to me, it just sounds like, you know, total stream of consciousness, you know, absolutely going for it. And um, so there's, that's one end of the spectrum. And then the other end of the spectrum, I love just really tasty, you know, blues playing like BB King or, you know, even Robin Ford, you know, really kind of melodic lyrical sort of playing so how and do you approach more. your solos in the studio do you um do you work at them at all or do you is, is it take after take a different solo so yeah that's usually take after takes a different one because i like i um like i said i was playing saxophone when i was a kid and um it was primarily jazz my dad was a big jazz freak so so i'm really still into improvisation on guitar so when we play live i'll tend to improvise a lot as well um and it doesn't always result in the best you know outcome like it's it, it probably not as well structured sometimes as a as a really well thought out solo and stuff but um but when you do um chance to find a really good one it's you sort of hit into a, a, a special gear or something yeah. uh, but you know sometimes i'll have a rough idea of what i'm going to play you know it on a song and and sort of structured around that but i'll always kind of leave some of it open to just you know the, the spur of the moment so who are who are some of the sax players that you uh admire and borrow lines from um well i've got my train t-shirt on today i yeah. love coltrane but i don't i don't necessarily borrow lines from him like he's completely different you know style to what, what i would play guitar but guitar wise um Trying to think, like, um, uh, you know, I love like Eric Clapton, um, Dwayne Allman. Um, uh, oh, I love like Paul Kozoff, 
Um, Paige, obviously, you know. Um, who else? Um, yeah, I know there's just so many of them. It's really hard for me to just... I don't know, Joe Perry I love as well. Yeah. Um, I really love Ace Freely, like, um, big Kiss fans. So Ace kind of gets written off, I reckon, by a lot of the kind of ser- serious musos. But I reckon his solos are great. Like, they're super singable, you know, when you um, hear one of his... You know, like, if you hear one of his solos, you know it's him straight away. He's got a real signature kind of style. Yeah, uh, Red Hot is the current single, um, and you've already said in the the press release that you've uh, borrowed a, a vibe of, of Free of Paul Kossoff in that song. Oh what, yeah, was it? What is it? Of, or what was it about the Free sound that uh, that you love so much? Um, I love the space. Like I love the um, the unhurriedness of it. You know, um, this this it's got such swagger because of how little they play um they're not just trying to fill fill the space all the time it's um and i reckon they were really unique at that time like for doing that because all the other bands were sort of just going for it more you know like the zeppelins and sabbaths and whatever like but free are just so back on the beat you know and like i reckon that's really the blueprint for the acdc sound as well you know that Highway to Hell, for example, just a da na na, da na na. This is such big space in between chords. Um, so yeah, there's that for for Red Hot. Definitely, it's an influence for sure. Yeah, uh, you debuted the video for that song on a Brazilian website. Um, tell me about the relationship between the band and Brazil. Um, that's just kicked off actually. So um, yeah, we. We'll probably be looking to tour um, Brazil and South America next year. Uh, we were going to be going to Europe this year again, but um, obviously we can't now with the restrictions. But um, yeah, I mean, hopefully it's the beginning of something big and fruitful because um, I would absolutely love to tour South America. Yeah. Um, what do you remember about writing Red Hot? Um, the other thing too I thought with that song was... Um, in the first verse, ha- not having any bass guitar, so just having the riff, the drums, and the and the vocals. That I kind of got from um, I, like I always wanted to have a song like that. There's there's a Kiss song called King of the Nighttime World, where where there's that um, that situation, just guitar, drums, and vocals, and then the bass comes in in the chorus, and it's obviously has a lot more impact in doing so. But um, so that was another thing that I kept for that song but what else um it's pretty hard it's going back quite a while (laughs) like we actually recorded the album like over a year ago and i would have written that probably a good half a year before that so um but yeah like i'll just record all my songs it's now with, with logic and stuff it's it's so easy for me to demo something at home and um like even though i'm not a great drummer i've got a a v drum set so i can I'll just put down the, the basic structure of the song on a guitar, um, then just get on the drum kit, bash out the drums, put in another guitar and a bass, and then start, you know, scribbling the lyrics down and, and singing the song. And, and by the end of that, you've got something that actually sounds not far off, like a, a releasable quality recording. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's a super fun process, actually, because before that, you really sort of, when you... If you write it, it's really hard to write at home on your own for a rock band, I reckon, unless you've got that. Um, otherwise, jamming like with the band is, is a much better better way. But if you're stuck at home like we are now, it's hard. So. Uh, there are 10 songs on the album. Uh, did you have many others to play around with? Um, yeah, we had about, probably about 20, and half of those ended up on the cutting room floor. And um, It's funny, actually, Damo was just texting me one the other day. He was like, we've got to bring this one back into the mix of the next record because... Some of the ones that missed out, we probably thought maybe should have been on <clears throat> on the record at the time. Um, it was harder for us to um, sort of decide which songs this time around because uh, Jaws, our then drummer, was living overseas, moving overseas and stuff. Um, whereas now we've got a drummer, so when it comes time to working out which songs we want to put on the next record, we'll be able to really test them out a bit better. 
So, yeah, it's it's um it's good to have he- like this time around we're gonna have heaps of songs as well. We'll probably have like thirty or forty to choose from. Um, but I still love to keep it just a small, you know, thirty-five minutes kind of a record because I think the rock and roll record it's just far more listenable that way. Yeah, uh, Reptilian Overlord is uh, the title track, uh, which to me uh, sounds a bit like early Sabbath. I get that kind of vibe. But how did yeah. that, how did that end up being the title track? Um, oh, I think we just thought it was pretty funny and. Um, the, I thought it made for a pretty good attention-grabbing kind of album title, you know, and good like artwork sort of concept as well for the for the record, um, and it could such a sort of epic song, having it right at the end of the album, like track ten was was the was like a good good kind of thing as well, having the title track right at the right at the end. I guess it makes people listen right through to the record to get to the end, <laughs> so. There's that too, but um, yeah. But you're right there. It's definitely got a bit of a set of vibes, particularly towards the end. Um, Hollywood Riot, when I uh, first heard that, I I thought Humble Pie. Um, Were they a band uh, that's in your record collection? I absolutely love Humble Pie. Yeah, massive fan. Um, Steve Marriott. Steve Marriott for me is like the the greatest um, rock vocalist ever. You know, he's... He's got the greatest voice. Him and probably Paul Rogers are my two favourite uh, singers. Um, so yeah, good good call on that one. I lo- absolutely love Humble Pie. Yeah, uh, the track "Lost and Lonely." Um, the, the first guitar line. Uh, I, I thought of the band Boston and uh, Tom oh, yeah. Sh- Tom Schultz and his, Schultz. his, yeah, yeah, his yeah. guitar line. So was that something you got into? Oh, I mean, I I like that stuff. It's it wasn't. In, interestingly, that wasn't what I had in mind for that. For that, I had in mind more of those Eagles esque kind of harmonies, like off one of these nights. You know that kind of um, is it Don Felder and um, Joe Walsh harmonies. You know, yeah. that was the kind of thing I had in mind when I was doing that song. But yeah, no, I still love Tom Schultz. It's great. Yeah, um, uh, the drum intro to "Stand Back" uh, to me was very Susie Quattro. Yep, yep, yep. Um, it's got that kind of glam vibe to it for sure so yeah Susie Quattro Susie Quattro was like my first um female like my crush you know when I was a little kid I remember seeing her on Countdown and just being like whoa who's that (laughs) yeah but yeah love Susie I mean all those all these sounds uh are probably more just in your DNA rather than going for motifs that uh that connect to these bands I imagine that that's exactly right Greg, um, it's it's more of a subconscious thing, and they're just so deeply embedded. You know, it's it's not like it's rare that I'll that I'll actually think, oh, I want to do something that sounds like this. Um, like even with Red Hot, when we were talking about Red Hot before, I'm not going. Oh, I want to write a free kind of song. It's just I'm just doing that, and it's like, yeah, it's got that free kind of thing, and that's obviously coming from there. You know, but yeah. Yeah, um, you had the uh, the master of classic Oz rock, Mark Opitz, uh, produce the album. Yeah. Um, what is it about Mark's production style that gets that classic rock vibe? Um, I think he was well. One thing about Mark was he was really um, big on us getting the energy of the takes. You know, like. Um, especially when we're doing the band, the initial band track, like really capturing the energy, you know, no, no click tracks, just keeping it really organic and, um, and as natural and as energetic and spontaneous as could be. So, so that was one thing. Otherwise, like his kind of little mix magic touches, I, it's, it was hard for me to kind of, um, sort of observe what he was doing there, but, um, he's definitely got a magic touch there for sure. Yeah. What about the miking of the amps? Oh yeah, so he had a he had a this way of miking the guitar amps, which um, I want to get. It was this kind of like it was two mics. They were sort of like like this. Like that makes sense. Like pointed at one speaker, but they were both at different angles, but close together. And um, that was all. We didn't have like a room mic. 
it was just and they were like a little bit back it wasn't right up on the speaker um but yeah he was he'll probably kill me for for revealing that secret information <laughs> but um yeah so but he definitely pulled up a good good guitar sound yeah oh tell me about the guitars that you used in the recording yeah so i used my um used my 69 sg which i've got here it's a 1969 um, gibson um which i picked up in um 1999 uh for 999 dollars when i was i was studying architecture at uni and um couldn't afford the guitar but i got a student loan and um bought the guitar and that's been with me ever since. I've sold it twice and got it back twice, but that's that's kind of been like my main axe through through the band. And I've had like probably 20 Les Pauls or so. And for the album, I used like an R9 Les Paul. And I also used the SG. And actually for that record, that was it. That was it. Yeah. yeah. Just, but, a, just a Les Paul and the SG. I, I know you play strats occasionally as well, but what is it about the uh, Les Pauls and SGs that you prefer? Um, I love the thick sort of creaminess of the tone, and especially as a three-piece that that, um, that works really well. Like single coil pickups, obviously they sound sort of thinner, and um, I love the classic sort of humbucker sound for, for a three-piece because it fills it out more. Yeah. Especially so, like Les Paul, you've got a bit more weight there, so that kind of makes it bigger as well. Yeah. When did you first become satisfied with the combination of amp and guitar sound? Um, I think going back to when I got my high watt, I got a custom, you know, like a custom shop sort of hand wired high watt, and um, it was actually that was when I was playing guitar for Jimmy Barnes, and. Um, it was so loud though that even Jimmy, who loves it loud, was telling me to turn down. Like, <laughs> but um, so I had that one modded to 50 watt. I got it ordered in a 50 watt transformer, and um, that that head is amazing sounding. It's such such a great sounding head. So that one, and also of all amps, just a little PD 50 watt classic, like a four by ten thing that I got. Um, I replaced all the speakers, replaced all the valves, and got a bit of work done on it. And that thing absolutely smokes. It sounds so good. That's that's um, you can hear that on our live stream gig that we did on, on the Music Land thing recently. But sounds incredible. Yeah. So, what is your current stage rig? Um, well, I've been using that PD combo like a lot because it's um, it's not quite as loud as the high watt, and it's easy for me to like you know, cut around. Um, when I think back to when I just always used to use 100 watt Marshalls cranked up, I just, like, I can't believe how loud we must have been. <laughs> it's just crazy loud, you know, in, in venues with only, like, you know, a couple hundred people. It was, would have been blowing their heads off. But, um, yeah, I'm kind of more into just it being not quite as loud now and just, just getting a really, really good time with the amp, being able to crank the amp without it, like, you know, ripping your head off. Um, did you use much in the way of pedals on the album? Um, not really, like straight through that high watt mostly and the PV and I would have used an old, I've got a TS-808, um, old Ibanez, um, Tube Screamer, um, would have used that and a clone, um, clone as well, like a, it's a mythical overdrive, I used that as well, um, and a wah, like a cry baby wah as well. Yeah. So uh, you're not going to be going out playing live anytime soon. So what are the revised plans for the album? Yeah, so, I mean, it gets released um, late August. And, like, I'd love to do another live stream gig like we did, the Music Land one, because that was super well received. And, like, I thought it sounded really good. And, like, I, it was... A little bit of a nervous moment for me because honestly beyond just the odd little mobile phone clip at a gig i'd never really seen the band live so it was a little bit like i just remember thinking oh this could go the way but then um when i watched it back i was like oh you know what we're actually a really good band <laughs> it sounds really good so so that was a big relief for me uh the casanova's album reptilian overlord is out august 28 uh tommy voice uh thanks for joining us and we look forward to uh the album release it's been an absolute pleasure greg thanks so much